Thanks, Will. So I have a question for you. Miss Lisa's going to throw a slide on here, but have you ever... What do you do with these two passages of Scripture? You have a very first slide that's got two passages on it. There it is. All right, James 2.24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Ephesians 2.8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. You ever seen those two right by each other? Notice anything about those two verses? Justified by works, not by faith alone. Faith, it is the gift of God, not the result of works. Wait, does the Bible contradict itself? We're going to explore that this morning because James and Paul do not disagree as much, but I want that to re- those two verses to ring in your head a little bit this morning. By faith or by works, or by both? How do these two guys both get in Scripture and say what seems to be the exact opposite? I mean, have you ever wondered about your faith? Have you ever wondered about whether or not you are saved? Have you ever had a moment of doubt where it's like, I know I'm supposed to love Jesus, I know I'm supposed to be a Christian, but there's that moment in your life where you go, I didn't feel very Christian this weekend, I wonder if I still am. You ever experienced that? Just me? Okay. Um, so, like, I was in college. I had friends that responded to every altar call ever presented just to make sure. You know what I mean, right? If the pastor opened the door to come down and get, be saved and don't go to hell, my friends were like, <laughs> you know, even if they did it the weekend before or the night before at a revival or something, they're like, I'm just not sure because, you know, last night was rough. And when you read James and he says, You say you have faith, but show me your faith by your works. Some of us kind of go, am I really saved? I mean, I had that crisis of conscience when I first became a Christian. There's actually two parts to my salvation story. I won't share them all with you, but I prayed the prayer with my pastor when I was 12. And by the time I was 15, it was like I had never prayed the prayer. Maybe you can relate. And so I had this moment where my youth pastor said, hey, maybe... If you have faith in Christ, it's supposed to have something to do with the way you live. And I was like, oh, maybe so. Why doesn't it? And we had that conversation. And so I would say that I made a more serious commitment of faith when I was 15 than when I did when I was 12. Had something happened to me, would I go to heaven? Probably. I don't know. Thank goodness I didn't have to worry about that. But I wasn't sure at 15 that I really was a Christian, even though I had prayed to prayer. We've all wondered, we've all had questions, we've all had doubts. And let me reassure you this morning that if you've ever sat down and said, I'm just not sure if I'm a good Christian or not, or I'm not sure if I am a Christian or not, that you're not alone in that. In fact, the doubt and the wonder is probably good. It really is the Bible's understanding of mystery. I mean, I've shared, I may have shared this before, but you know, Hollywood puts the mysteries in a nice little box called CSI. At the beginning, there's this crime. At the end, it's solved. Mystery solved, right? Or detective movie or whatever. There's a criminal and they chase him and it all wraps up in a nice little bow. Problem solved. The Bible's understanding of mystery is that God is truth. And when God gives you an answer, all that does is provoke more questions. You ever experienced that in your faith walk? It's like, God is love. Okay, does God love everybody? Does God love me? Is wherever love happens, is God there? Like it it opens up a can of worms. When you have a biblical truth that is true, that you can base your life on, all that does is provoke more questions. Like James and Paul talking about the same thing a little bit, but different, even sounding contradictory. Hey, you have faith, therefore you're saved. James goes, you say you have faith, but I will show you my faith through my actions which is true. They're both in the Bible, <laughs> right? And so we hold ideas, I, side, side roll here. Predestination or free will? I don't know. <laughs> right? Like, is God sovereign or do people, can people mess up, up God's plan? I'm opening a can of worms right there, right? The Bible's understanding of mystery is that sometimes truth just creates more questions and that 
is okay. And when you place your faith in Christ and you start to follow him and you start reading the Bible and you go, that's in there? That's an okay place. That's a cool thing. Because honestly, if everything you know about God or your understanding of God is all tie tied up in a nice little bow and a neat little package, you've got a very weak, empty version of God. You will never wrap your brain around every aspect of his personality or character or will or sovereign will or why doesn't he really get rid of the bad people? I don't know. I wish he did. Why doesn't he get rid of COVID? I don't know. I wish he would. And the moment you think that you have got all figured out, is the moment you realize you just have your own little corner of the universe figured out and not a God that's much bigger than that box. In fact, if God fits in your box, he's too weak. And your box needs to expand. <laughs> I shared this a couple of times. I shared it with my Bible study, Bible study Wednesday night, but my seminary professor used to say this, the greater the area of your knowledge, geometry people, the greater the circumference of your ignorance. If you know your geometry terms, the greater the area of your knowledge, the greater the circumference of your ignorance. <laughs> the bigger the circle of your knowledge is, the, bigger you, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So when you think you got it all figured out, all you've done is figured out what you don't know, which is cool. That's the Bible's understanding of mystery. So when we hold two ideas like this intention that we're going to explore today, you may not walk out of here with it resolved, and that's cool. That means you can just dig that much further and expand your area of knowledge and your ignorance or something. I love it. Okay, so having said all that, we're going to dig into James chapter 2. Starting in verse 14. And we'll get to 24 in a minute because it's going to be in here too. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked or lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, yet do not, do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself has, that, that has no work, if it has no works, is dead. Let's pause right there. We'll, we'll keep going later. So, what's James, so James, one of the things I've discovered about James as we study him is he'll open a section of pastoral teaching in the letter with a question. And then he'll resolve the question and give a proverb at the end. If you go read James, you'll notice it several times as we talked about it. He'll say, can you have faith and show favoritism? Rhetorical question. And then he'll run through it. We have another question here, right? My brothers and sisters... What good is if you say you have, have faith but have no works? There's the question. He's doing the pastoral think through. He's going to dig into this. Then he gives an example. But before we get to the example, read the question again. Because sometimes when we read this stuff, we have this, our brains are wonderful. They fill in, they fill in spaces. Like without even like subconsciously realizing they fill in spaces. And so like, you ever seen little things floating around Facebook? If you can read this and it's all backwards and your brain can just turn it around and you can read it, that kind of stuff. Or if, if, I, put, if I put a Bible verse up here with like a couple of letters missing, you'd still know what the word is. Like your, your brain automatically fills in the gaps. Sometimes when we read scripture, if we've read it over and over and over again, we assume it says things it doesn't say. Like how many wise men were there at the Christmas story? Anybody? Three? Is that the guess? Three? How sure are you? Go read it again. It does not say. We make the assumption it's three because of, thank you for setting me up, John, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We assume three gifts, three people. It doesn't say. And by the way, if you're traveling through the Middle East with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, you probably have a small armed force with you too. If you're smart, if you're going to walk from Baghdad to Jerusalem with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, you're not like, I'm going to get on my bike and tool over there. You've got an armed guard with you on foot in the wilderness with gold. So can you imagine when they show up at Jesus' house 
and they get off the ho- their camels with their scimitars, you know, like big old curved swords and the whole, and here's the chest of gold. How's that for a pre, that's, we're not at Christmas yet, but how is that for a nativity scene, right? Does your nativity scene have people with swords? You know, <laughs> the wise men are like, here's our gold, frankincense, and myrrh. By the way, they weren't even at the manger scene, which is another one example of what I'm talking about. Are you with me now? When you read the Bible, it goes, it says this, does it? Perfect example. The verse we just read, verse 14. Does he say, if you don't have works, you won't be saved? Let's read it again. Verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith? Did you miss that the first time? If you claim to have faith but do not have works, can faith save you? Remember, I started this conversation with, have you ever been uncertain about your faith? You claim to be a Christian. You know people who claim to be a Christian, but otherwise don't look like it? So what's James' concern? His primary concern, really, of this whole letter is genuine faith. But wait a minute, I thought James was all about works for salvation. It's not what he's saying. He's, his readers, he's wanting to make sure their faith is the genuine article. The previous questions, can you show favoritism and have faith? Can you have faith and not demonstrate it? Can you claim to be a Christian and not live like one? Not a Christian without works is dead. Someone who claims to be a Christian but doesn't live that way, their faith is dead. So you might think you're a Christian and not be one. Does that make anybody nervous? You may think you're a follower of Jesus but not be one if that faith doesn't have an impact on the way you live. That's what James is saying in verse 14. They claim to have faith, but they don't live like they do. Now remember, he's writing to a church. He's not writing to lost people out in the world. He's writing to a group of people who worship Jesus, and some of them are claiming to be a follower, but they don't live that way. Because I'm sure churches back then and churches now, totally different. Claims to be a Christian. Verse 15 and 16. If a brother or sister is naked or lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, yet do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So he's given a metaphor, right? He's giving this hypothetical example. He says if a brother or sister is lacking daily supply, daily clothing, daily food, what's a brother or sister? It's a fellow Christian. The person sitting next to you in worship doesn't have what they need, and all you do is give them share, share peace, Go and be well, be fed, be rested. And that's all you do? How good is that? He's given an example. If you say you're a Christian and don't demonstrate it, is your faith genuine? If somebody sitting next to you in church doesn't have what they need, and you go, have a great week, that's just as empty as claiming to be a Christian and it not change you. And it not change you. It's an empty faith when you don't demonstrate it. So he is refuting this idea that you can just say you're a Christian and nothing else changes. In every other aspect of your life, you look just like you did the day before you decided to follow Jesus. Verse 18 and 19. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and and I, by my works, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe this and shudder. Okay, so he's giving another hypothetical conversation, which was very common of writers of that day. They would tell you, they would teach by, here's what this person says, and this is what this person says back. It was a teaching method. So this is not an, may not be an actual conversation with somebody in church, but he says, you say you have faith, 
I have works, or I have faith, you do your works. This is an this is a ancient version of you do you, I'll do me. <laughs> you have faith, that's cool, I've got works. I'm spiritually superior to you. Or I have faith, you go do all that work stuff. That's, we say, here's how we say it now. That's not my calling. You ever heard that phrase in church world? Oh, you, you, you share the gospel with people? That's really cool that God's gift you do that. That's not me, though. I can't do that. You have your faith. You have your works. I have my faith. Uh-oh. <laughs> Why would you separate faith from works? Why would you try? James doesn't want them to. James says, you claim faith, but I will show it to you by my work. But he refutes the idea that these two things can be separated. Now, why would you separate faith from works? Why would you want to be just in the faith camp? Or why would you just want to be in the works camp? But primarily, this is what James is primarily worried about. He would be talking to people in his congregation that are primarily worried about the faith thing. They're like, I believe I'm cool. You do your work thing. That's who he's talking to. Now, I have, three re- I have three theories about why somebody would try to separate that out. Number one, they don't want to do the sacrificial work of the faith. If I'm really a Christian, it means I'll have to give up fill in the blank. So I'm just going to say I believe and let that be good enough because if I really let belief change me, it means I have to give up friends. I might have to give up Habits on Friday night, I might have to give up a portion of my wealth in this thing we call a tithe. It might cost me something if I'm really all in. I might have to like help people that I don't like. I might have to love my enemy. I might have to be charitable. <laughs> These are all terrible things, right? But if I can separate faith and works, then I can have my faith and somebody who is gifted at evangelism, somebody who's gifted at charitable work and mission work, they can, they can be the church for me. I get a pass. That's one reason why you would separate the two. The second one, they want the fire insurance and still go on and live the way they want. Hey, I've got my insurance policy. If I die, I'll be with Jesus. In the meantime, it doesn't have anything to do with anything else that I do. I'm going to make all the money, get all the toys, do all the stuff I've ever wanted to do, but I've got my insurance policy. I'm not going to do faith actions because I'm going to go after this. I'm going to pursue the kingdom I was already building when Jesus suddenly disrupted that plan. And I'd rather separate the two and let somebody else be the faithful person who does all the cool stuff. Maybe I will give to fund it. Three. And this one's hard. This one's hard for most of us who are faithful Christians. An intense fear of what somebody might say if I'm really acting like a Christian. Because, as we'll see this in the coming weeks, following a Christian looks foolish to the rest of the world. You give 10% of what you own, what you earn to the church? You know what you could do with that in a Roth IRA? I mean, <laughs> it looks like foolishness to the world. You love your enemy? That's crazy. you got to crush them. The wisdom of God looks foolish to the world. If you act Christian and somebody can tell that you are a Christian, it's embarrassing. And so I'm going to say I believe, but I'm not going to outwardly act that way because I don't want people to really know. Because then they might ask questions or I might look silly or I might look foolish to them for following that fairy tale, quote unquote. Because the wisdom of God looks foolish to the world. There's another layer to it in James' day because to be overtly Christian might get you killed. So he's not necessarily saying these people are afraid of being outward Christians because they're embarrassed. There's a very real layer that means being out an outward Christian might cost them their job, their family, or even their life because they're being persecuted if somebody knows they're a Christian. And we're embarrassed because we give up our Sunday morning to go to church. In his day, being a Christian might get you thrown to lions. And there are Christians around the world that that is still a real threat. To gather for his church, they pray that they're not 
invaded and arrested by the local government and executed. That's the real deal. And we're like, eh, it's a little sunny, a little rainy and cold. I'm not going to church today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so James says, you say you have faith. Show me. Show me. It, if you say you do, but you don't do anything about it, is it real? Is it the genuine article? His concern is not so much even morality. His concern is, is the faith real transformative belief? Not because you earn your salvation by something you do, but that because you are saved and because you belong to Jesus, you do stuff. Does that make sense? In other words, it's not because I can do more to make God love me more tomorrow. If I can do one more thing, if I pray a little more, if I journal in my journal a little bit more, if I go to one more church service, Jesus will love me that much more. That's not what James is saying. James is saying, because I belong to Jesus, I want to be at church every time the door is open. I want to share my faith. I want to be generous. I want to be loving because Jesus has changed my heart towards those things. If you claim to have that transformation, where is the transformation? That's what he's asking. Because without that transformation, your faith is dead. It's as good as dead. Because it's not benefiting the person next to you that says they're in need. Verse 20, <laughs> verse 20 James kind of drops some puns in here that you don't know unless you know kind of thing. But here's what it says. Do you want to be shown a senseless person that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Verse tw I read 21 also. Verse 20, do you want to be shown to be senseless? The King James says vain person. You want to be seen to be a vain person. In the Greek, vain means empty. It's a little bit of a play on words. Your faith is empty. Do you want to be seen as an empty person? He's calling them empty. Right? He's like, do you want to be seen that way? And by the way, make sure it's still here so I get this right. Do you want to be shown apart? Oh, this says works is barren in this translation. Other, your translation might say your faith apart from works is dead. When somebody dies and their spirit leaves, their body is empty. So another, the verse has the same play on words twice. You, do you want to be a dead person? Because dead people have no spirit in them. They're empty. He's playing on the, the meaning of those words. It's really interesting. All right. Verse 22, 21 through 24. He gives, the, he gives the metaphor, right? He gives the case balance for this. Was not your ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with works and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus scripture was fulfilled when it says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, that person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them by another road? Abraham and Rahab. Abraham, the father of the Israel people. Rahab, a prostitute and a Canaanite. Both in the Old Testament, by the way. Justified by their works. So he's making his case that works has something to do with justification. But he's not using justification the same way Paul uses justification. Just like every time when you read the New Testament, it says saved. It doesn't always mean saved the way you think it means saved. I know that's confusing, right? I told you biblical mystery. How back to that one. Saved doesn't always mean saved, like fire insurance saved. Saved might mean sanctified, depending on the context. Remember, we started this whole little journey here comparing Paul to James and holding those two verses next to each other. One says by works and one says by faith. Which is it? Except they're both talking about two different concerns. When Paul in Ephesians talks about being saved by faith and not by works, he's talking about keeping God's law. Don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, don't do what things, God, things that God doesn't want you to do. By trying to be morally perfect, you won't save yourself. James is calling us 
to live like we have a genuine faith that changes us. And justified has this sense of confirmed. The commitment, the commitment that you made is demonstrated. Abraham, his faith in God, his belief in God was demonstrated by his, desire, his willingness to kill his own son Isaac. He didn't earn his salvation by being willing to hold a knife over Isaac. He demonstrated that he trusted God to provide one way or the other. Resurrect him, give him another kid, even though he's 100 and something. He had faith in what God had promised him. And he demonstrated that faith by being willing to sacrifice Isaac. Rahab wasn't even Jewish. In fact, she was a prostitute. But she demonstrated her faith in God and the God of Israel by not turning the spies over to the Canaanites. She demonstrated her belief in who God is, that God was real, by protecting the Canaanite spies. She demonstrated her faith. Now, just when you think maybe, this still sounds like a contradiction a little bit, Charlie. Put this, you get the slide, the second slide with my verses again. Okay, I've added a verse this time, not to trick you, but just to show you something. James 2.24, you see, a person is justified works not by faith alone, James. Paul, the same verse we read, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. But look at verse 10, the very next verse, by the way, for we are what God has made us. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Which God prepared beforehand to be our very way of life. Are they still contradicting each other? What's Paul saying in the role of works? For by grace you have been saved. Saved meaning salvation, eternal destination. Through faith... This is not you. You can't earn your way there by what you do. By keeping the law is impossible. We did the Ten Commandments this summer. I could go back over that and show you why you don't. <laughs> this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of your works. Sounds like it contradicts James. So that one may boast. Because guess what? If you could spiritually earn your way to heaven, you'd be walking around going, look how good a Christian I am. I'm in good standing with Jesus. So nobody can boast. For we are what God made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We don't earn our salvation by work. We prove it. And Paul adds, we were made for it. They're not contradicting each other. James says, you claim you have faith. Show me the transformation in the way you treat others. Paul says, faith is what saves you. And if you are saved... You will do the works that God decided for you to do. You will demonstrate your faith by being His workmanship. It's only when you pull Bible verses out of, out, of, out of context that appear to contradict each other. When you realize Paul's talking about moral code and James is talking about charitable action, when they say works, they don't contradict each other. And when Paul says in verse 10, you're supposed to be doing good works if you belong to God and have faith. They don't contradict each other. That's what James is concerned about too. That his congregation would live into the faith they claim to have in the way that they live out their faith. There's no contradiction. There's a different point in emphasis. And if you don't read verse 10, it sounds like they're saying the exact opposite thing. But they're, they've got different pastoral concerns. They're talking to two different churches. They're talking to two group, different groups of people at two different times. And two primary focuses. James wants to make sure that the people who claim to follow Jesus, that it's demonstrated in the way that they live. Not just in like being a good person and keeping rules, but in living in the way Christ called us to live. Loving, sacrificial, giving, putting the needs of others first. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. That's what he's talking about. But if you claim that, but you're scared of being persecuted or you're scared of being embarrassed or you really just want to have your own empire and just get your fire insurance, then that's dead. It's useless. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's the same thing as walking up to him going, be well and stay warm. It's an empty gesture. And by the way, 
Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. I kind of skipped over that in there. But do the, you think demons don't know that Jesus really is who he claimed to be and believe it? You see, faith is not simply intellectual acknowledgement of a creed. The demons have that on lock too. They know God's real. They know Jesus is real. They know Jesus did what he said he did and meant what he said. And they're not in better shape than we are, <laughs> so to speak. You know what I mean? They believe, they have an intellectual understanding of the truth. What James wants from us is a genuine, transformational, demonstrable faith. At least the demons have the courtesy to realize it's true and they shudder. If we know it and really believe it, we won't shudder, we'll live into it. That's the charge. That's the command. That's the call. And then the rest of the book, as we go forward, you'll see he starts nailing down different things about wisdom and generosity and how to live the way a Christian is called to live if they have real faith. So Will's going to come up, or the band's going to come up. They're going to play. We're going to spend a few, just a few minutes reflecting on this because here's my challenge. I started at the beginning and I said, we've all had doubt. We've all had moments where like, do I really believe this stuff or do I just know this stuff? Has my faith led to a change in who I am? Am I a different person than I was 10 years ago or five days ago when I prayed, professed faith in Christ? Has it changed who I am? Does it drive how I live or is it a thing that I add to my list of things? I have home season tickets and I have church that I go to. Like it's in that same realm of what I occupy my time with or has it completely changed who I am? Because if it's not transformative, it's dead. If it's not accompanied by works of charity and love and sacrifice, it's useless, it's empty, it's in vain. So as we go to a little bit of time of prayer, I ask you this one single question. Is your faith genuine? And if it is, what is God asking you? What is God asking you to do that you're not doing yet? Where's the evidence? Where's the works? And we'll answer James's question for ourselves. Dear brothers and sisters, you say that you have faith, but do you have works that come from that faith? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rest in the fact that you are our Heavenly Father. By your Spirit, make our faith alive and well. Take us beyond the point of just believing. Take us beyond the point of just knowing you are who you say you are. And by your Spirit, transform the way we live out that faith. 
We trust you. We place our salvation in your hands. We expect you to love us. We know that you do. We have confidence in that truth. But by your power, let that confidence change how we live. Not because we can do one more thing to make you love us more, but because you have loved us and poured out your grace upon us over and over and over again. Cultivate in our heart a response to that overwhelming love and grace that transforms us and transforms everyone we come in contact with. They may know that you are who you said you are. By your grace, we live in faith. By your grace, we seek to live the way you called us to live as your workmanship, as your craftsmanship, as your works of art on this world. In your precious son's name, amen. A couple of announcements. Well, first of all, let me say this. If this conversation left you in doubt, I would love to talk to you so that you can know, okay? If it left you wondering, that's where we can go have some coffee and not wonder anymore. Because like James, I want you to have a faith that changes who you are.